to talk about how the police problem is actually systematic. There's a couple different things to take into account here. Um, first of all, I, I know some of you probably have heard this information, uh, so bear with me. Uh, the IQ test and the empathy test, if you score too high on either one of those things, they won't let you into the force. So if you're too empathetic and too smart, they're like, nah, we don't want you. You got to be just... You got to be just above average so you can follow orders and basically listen to the propaganda. And if we say that, uh, oh, the black people are going to be, uh, they're scary. They're scary, those black folks. Um, then you need to make sure that the IQ of that person is in line with that. Uh, there's an argument about good cops. I used to do a bit where I used to talk about the good cops. And this is four or five years ago that I did this bit, and it was very controversial. Uh, I was talking to my friend Jay yesterday, Jay Jackson yesterday, and I was basically like, well, I, I, really the bit is about media manipulation. Uh, and when I, when I started writing it, I was like, well, how do I get everybody to hate me uh, instead of just half the room? And I was like, oh, I know, I'll make it about police brutality too. <laughs> um, and we don't see these narratives about good cops, and there's a reason. One, they don't want to show you that, right? They don't want to show you the cops that are that actually are that live within the neighborhood that know what's going on in the neighborhood, right? That you know, if if Derek Chauvin and all those other cops lived in that neighborhood, maybe they would know who George Floyd was, and maybe they would know that he's not gonna be a a violent person despite his size, which they fucking they profiled him on various different accounts. Um, they would know he's the gentle giant. And they would have probably pulled him out of the car and said, hey, can you just go to the side of the road? We're going to ask you some questions. Counterfeit $20 bill, blah, blah, blah. That would have been a peaceful exchange. Those cops don't exist. Those cops get beaten out of the system. Um, I've heard several stories of, co uh, of, of good police officers that have had their, their families and their lives threatened by the rest of the force because they're going to call them out on some, some of their shit, on some of their racist, violent shit. They don't last in the system. The system is not built to keep them in there. The system is built to turn you, either turn you into a Derek Chauvin, a Daniel Pantaleo, these countless other killer cops that are out there, or they're removed. They have to leave the force because, they, they, because they're not protecting and serving their communities. They are protecting and serving the interests of the rich, the interests of corporations. They also have, um, there's a bunch of psychological reports that are out there that basically was like, oh yeah, cops have PTSD from just being cops. The job of being cops is, 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 is actually giving human beings PTSD, including people that decide to be cops. Uh, there's an us versus them mentality uh, that's bred into the police force. And uh, it comes from the fact that like all of us are like, they're the, they're the thin blue line between order and chaos and we are the chaos. So they have to keep the order. So they uh, see themselves above all of that, above these laws. So they can break the laws in order to make sure that there's order. And they only see you know, the dregs of society. They only see people breaking the law, committing crimes and things of that sort. So they equate all of the crimes to chaos. Hence why a counterfeit charge led to them using highly excessive force. That's why somebody getting pulled over for a routine traffic stop ends up getting dragged out, ends up getting shot. A basic burglary charge ends up with it with the uh, a kid with three bullets in his back. So, but it's that us versus them mentality. It's given them PTSD. Nobody's inviting cops over to be like, "Look, if you fucking bake these awesome ass cookies, oh my god, they're good." Are you vegan? We got vegan cookies. No one's doing that shit. I was trying to fucking have cops over for their rager, right? Like, you know, 
It's not super bad. No one's inviting the cop over to their fucking birthday party. But and that's partly because they're not they're not community driven cops. They don't live in the neighborhood. They don't fucking know you. They don't owe you shit. They're coming in from other neighborhoods, more affluent neighborhoods, and they look at these low income neighborhoods as trash. Again, that us versus them. They're reactive, they're defensive. And the system rewards this sort of shit. There's an encouragement to lie, especially with the NYPD. The NYPD is, has been encouraged to lie. And, um, and that is to protect the cops and to protect their way of doing things. This is what I mean. This is perjury. They're like they're encouraged to commit perjury, and they have to get and they get to get away with it. That's systemic. If they're COs and they're commissioners and the DAs, and possibly a vice presidential candidate is encouraging all of this stuff as she has, that's how deep rooted the problem is within the system. And then you have the militarization of the police, where the military gives their like old unwanted shit to these police departments, right? It's like well, that's not necessary. If you're if you're stop making a, a traffic stop, what do you what do you need battle armor for? I understand that things can go wild in any moment. I get it. No one's claiming that your job's not dangerous, bro. But why you got your fucking hand on your gun when you're coming to give me a speeding ticket or a warning that I was too close to a fucking truck or some shit? I... Because they're trained to be like the military. Fucking Dothan, Alabama doesn't need a tank in its police force. No cop is encouraged to be a part of um, the middle class, the working class people. There's no solidarity to them, uh, to us, right? That, that comes from the Boston police strike of what happens uh, when, uh, when um, cops strike back against the system. So what happened to the Boston police strike of 1919, over 100 years ago now, 101 years ago? Around this time, too, I think it started in the summer and then it escalated in the fall. I'm going to do a recap. I did a bigger, longer video about it that's on this channel that you can go check out if you would like to. I posted a bunch of but I posted it up a, a few times. Maybe some of you caught it. Maybe some of you didn't. I don't, I'm not particularly sure, but... Uh, basically, what happened with the Boston police strike is the police officers were asking for better hours, uh, better pay, and better living conditions because because they were working these long hours and they would get these very limited time off. And even that time off, if they wanted to leave the city of Boston, they had to get special permission, which most of the time they would get denied uh, because the police force would call them in on their day off anyway. So they're constantly working. They're not getting paid shit. Um, and... So they tried to, they basically unionized uh, the governor of Massachusetts, the mayor of Boston, and the president at the time uh, would not recognize the union and was like, your union's bullshit. H how about we just, uh, we'll get you some new uniforms. Is that cool? Is that good? Are you done? Shut the fuck up and get back on the job, right? That's kind of how they treated these cops. And uh, so the police were like, no, this is, this is ridiculous. Like this union's real. Like this union matters. It's a it's a legit fucking union, and so they decided that they're gonna strike. So like, I think like three quarters of them or something like that just didn't show up for duty, and they said that they're striking. So the mayor freaks out, deputizes a bunch of Harvard kids. So a bunch of fucking over hormonal eighteen year old kids are now deputized and armed to protect Boston. Because the mayor thought there would be riots. And basically what happened is a bunch of people saw these kids with guns and were like, holy shit, what is happening? And then panicked. So the mayor instigated 
a bunch of fucking riots. And then he calls the National Guard in, right? Like, he calls the governor. The governor is like, yep, we got to send a National Guard in. So the National Guard gets called in. That incites more shit. Now, at the end of it, th the unfortunate thing is that the, that the cops lost. That's why you'll never see another cop police strike. And that's why you probably will never see any of these police officers taking the side of protesters and activists or the working class and fighting on our behalf. Probably. There might be a few exceptions to the rule, but there's a good chance that that's not going to happen. Because what happened was they lost. They didn't get what they wanted. They didn't get better living conditions. They didn't get uh, better pay. They didn't get better um, hours. They got fired for 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 not showing up to the job. And then there was a um, there was major unemployment in 1919 because of World War II. So there were a bunch of out of work vets, and they were like, "Hey, vets, would you like to come become part of the police force?" And then they fucking hired a bunch of vets with PTSD from the war. And what did the vets get? They got the pay raise. They got the better hours. They got the better living quarters. So the lesson is, it's not that they didn't, couldn't give it to them. It's that they didn't want to give it to them. And they punished the cops for going against them. Because the cops are there to protect the establishment. They're there to protect the status quo. So if you're wondering why um, the, the Asian American police officer, I can't remember his name, apologize for that, uh, was standing to make sure nobody disrupts Derek Chauvin's knee to be on George Floyd's neck, it's because of that. If he goes against the system, they have drilled it into them through history that they will lose. They will get fired and lose everything. And the people they hire to replace them will get all of the demands that they're asking for. Basically, it puts the police in their place to say that the establishment owns the police. Now, this should piss off everybody in the police force. But... They are encouraged to have lower IQs and lower empathy, so I doubt that that will particularly happen. So it's systemic. It's a looping system of shittiness. Then you do have vets in PTS with PTSD. I remember um, when I was driving through Greensboro and and Charlotte uh, back in the fall. Remember when we were doing live events? You guys remember that? Um, <laughs> I was uh, I was driving. Uh, Greensboro to Greenville, and then I was going up to Charlotte and stuff on this tour. And uh, there was an ad that would play uh, when I was listening a lot more to Spotify before they fucked me over. But uh, was, there was an ad that was calling specifically for veterans that have military experience to join the Charlotte's Mecklenburg Police Department. And you can see these military tactics being used against the protesters, right? Because of the way they coordinate and the way they orchestrate certain things. Like the creepiest thing when the police car got set on fire yesterday at the Pittsburgh protest was the fact that when it happened, I didn't fucking hear um, one police siren. Not one. Until we got back to our cars and started driving back to my buddy's place. I didn't hear one fucking siren. And then I watched the videos about how they strategically circled and fucking trapped these protesters. And the protesters have to make barricades with garbage cans and cones and all this other shit. But the cops are in military gear with their tear gas canisters and their rubber bullet guns and their riot gear and their shields beating their shields like they're fucking Spartan warriors. Like they're reenacting 300 on the streets of Pittsburgh. And they want fucking veterans with military training so that they can look at us as insurgents. That's what they're making the police officers look at fucking protesters like. Like we're goddamn insurgents. This is the system that is in place. This is what these protests are trying to fight. And they're proving our point. So again, if you're one of these fucking moderate liberals that's like, Bad violence. 
dude, the example is right in front of you. Oh, like you just have to op be open your eyes. If it makes you uncomfortable, fucking good, man. Because we've been living in discomfort for a very long time and you've kind of not listened to it. So now we're kind of forcing it on you because that's the only way we feel like we can be heard. Like from the clip earlier, right? It's a language of the unheard. What is America not hearing? Not only that, but the training that these cops have to go through is also based on aggression and not on de-escalation. They don't get any mental health training. Uh, they only get training in, in aggressive shit. I mean, you can see it. If you watch the video of before um, George Floyd got arrested, the amount of aggression that they were using against him when he wasn't resisting is wild, and they're trained to do that. They're fucking trained to do that. So what's the solution to this stuff, right? Um, I talked about this about a year and a half ago. Uh, one of the solutions to something like this is community policing. You hire people from within the community itself. None of this outside hires. You don't fucking, um, uh, you don't fucking hire somebody from an at, like some affluent, richy, rich fucking neighborhood that has no, like they have no idea who lives here, what these businesses are about, who's going through a difficult time in the neighborhood. You need more of that community level policing, right? They have to live in the community to give a shit about the community. Um, and not in all instances, I get it. There's lots of communities that I don't live in that I care about. But I'm also not a fucking police officer that has a gun. So it's a little different. Um, I think we need peace officers. We need peace officers that are able to uh, moderate certain things, mediate, be the, be the middle person so that thing, you know, conflicts don't escalate. Uh, that doesn't happen when you show up in riot gear. That's never fucking known to happen. Are you shitting me? Even fucking when horse cops show up, things get crazy. And even then, it's like the horses are just like, I don't want to fucking be here. I'm on the side of the people. Horse lives matter too, motherfucker. And then they're fucking peacing out, right? Like, there's a bunch of horse cops that got ran out yesterday uh, in Pittsburgh, and it was awesome. It was hilarious to watch, right? Like, those horses were like, horse lives matter. Fuck it. We're leaving, right? And then, like, and now, I bet on Monday, those horses are going to turn in their two-week two notice. The other way we can do this is by compartmentalizing all of these jobs. Do we need riot cops? Maybe in instances where there's actually a fucking riot. You know, where there's like an act, like when it does become like an insurgency situation, protesting isn't fucking that. Do you need to fucking have your, you know, um, a, 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 gun and bulletproof vest and a baton and a taser and a fucking sound cannon when you're giving a traffic ticket when somebody makes a wrong left turn somebody's blinkers going off probably fucking not so we got to compartmentalize this stuff so that the militarized police aren't handing out tickets. And then when somebody reaches over for their driver's license, they go, whoa, and then they shoot them. Because they have PTSD again, um, um, towards the regular average citizen. Because, they're, because it's us versus them. Because that's what the system tells them to do. And because they have a lower IQ, they're not willing to understand any of that shit just this infinite fucking bullshit cycle that ha that happens that's what we're fighting for it's important to understand this it's important to have conversations about this and it's important to know why this anger from the people is justified uh we got comments mark viola comedian mark viola vicious circle goes round and round never stops that's what makes it vicious and a circle. Uh, he's right. That's what makes both of those things what they are. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's that's the problem with the system is the system is in, intended on being a vicious circle. And even the people that are protecting this this system are, are victims of the system itself, but they just don't understand that they're victims, so they attack other people. 
they're they're being gaslit by the system that is in place uh which sucks hey thank you so much for tuning into this video if you enjoyed the content that you saw in this video please hit the subscribe button please hit the like button and share this with some people uh, that you think would enjoy or benefit from uh, a video like this. Um, as some of you might know, if you have already subscribed, I am a uh, full-time touring performer that has been grounded uh, due to the pandemic situation that we are seeing all across the country. So I am going to be doing some virtual live stand-up comedy shows. I've done a few of these already. I'm doing them every single Friday in June at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Each show is going to be different. Each show talks about uh, different topics, different themes, different jokes. So uh, if you're interested in um, the topics that we discussed today, you'll probably be interested in a show like that. And because of everything that is going on um, in our society right now with the protests and um, and the the uh, the activism that we're seeing, um, uh, the Friday, June fifth show, one hundred percent of those ticket sales will be donated to the Minnesota Freedom Fund, uh, and then uh, going forward, fifty percent of every single uh, show's ticket sales will be donated to the Minnesota Freedom Fund. Uh, for June. So uh, grab your tickets, help out a good cause, come check out a, a, a cool, interesting show that you probably won't catch on uh, uh, on any sort of mainstream comedy network. Um, the other thing is I'm also releasing a brand new stand-up comedy album called Politely Angry. I toured it all across the country uh, for about a year. It's recorded in uh, St. Louis, Biloxi, and Rochester, New York. You can uh, pre-order it on uh, Bandcamp right now, but it's also going to be released on June 1st and will be available on all the other uh, streaming and downloading platforms. You can go directly to my website, krishmohan.com, to grab your copy of the album, grab your tickets to come see the show, um, and while you're there, you can also make a donation to, to me if you would like to, if you would like to make a one-time donation or become a sustaining member, that's also an option as well. Once again, you can go to krishmohan.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N. Thank you very much. And we'll